Hi, boys and girls. Welcome to week seven of the college football season. I'm Uncle Crappy. There's Carla. Hi, Carla. Hello. We are also joined by AJ, fresh back from a Midwestern road trip. AJ? Just a lovely oh, just a lovely tour of Ohio. Mm. Just driving across the whole state twice in one day. Just a delight. <laughs> that everybody <laughs> loves. Everybody loves the Ohio roadway system. Oh, God. That, uh, the drive I-71. From, I-71. From Columbus to Cincinnati, it's just awful. It is. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's my least favorite part sh- of the commute home. I just want to give a lovely shout out to the five Please. folks at Subaru mm-hmm. for uh, everything they've done for the like halfway to self-driving systems they have. Okay. What a delight. Okay. Uh, lane keep and uh, cruise control. That'd be helpful. That monitors in front of the cars. In front. Okay. It's it is I, you still have to pay attention mm-hmm. you still have to keep your hands on the wheel mm-hmm. you still have to you know be an active and alert driver but the amount of like not thinking about it i have to do right tremendous i love you subaru <laughs> uh and uh subaru we would love a sponsorship so you know yeah, drop a, listen drop a sponsorship make my yeah. lease free i would love yeah. that that'd be great yeah, that'd, be, that'd be fantastic <laughs> that'd be fantastic um guys it is always the weeks that look kind of blah on paper, uh, when when the insanity happens, we this is this is a documented fact, and it happened last week, um, in no particular order. The SMU beating ranked Louisville, Minnesota beating USC, Washington getting revenge on Michigan, Texas A and M destroying Missouri, Arkansas beating Tennessee, dogs and cats living together, and then Carla, there was that game in your backyard that there was. was the the biggest one of them all. I was, I, I had no idea. I was at a birthday party. I was out in downtown Pittsburgh, not looking at my phone. So I didn't realize until I got home um, that uh, Vanderbilt had beaten number one, Alabama on Saturday <laughs> in, in Nashville. Um, now, Carla, you were, were you, were you were watching the whole game? We watched, um, I was in a quad box at that point, but then okay. when when Vandy was ahead in the fourth quarter, went full screen with it to watch the end of that game. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we were trying to like get dinner ready while we were watching that, but like we delayed dinner because we were standing <laughs> in the living room watching this game. Um, and then, you know, when, when, when they got the last first down that they needed and you knew mm-hmm. that they could run out the clock, um, I, you know, other than like fist pumps and high fives with my husband um, in the living room, the first words out of my mouth were get those goalposts to the river. <laughs> um, and that's exactly what they did. And the yeah. next hour or so on social media was just an absolute delight. It was like the early days of Twitter all over again, mm-hmm. following the goalposts, people jumping in, um, you know, and people don't realize like if you're not from Nashville, like the distance from Vanderbilt Stadium to the Cumberland River is two and a half miles. Yeah. It's yeah, not like it. what the, what happened the, in, in Knoxville, with Tennessee. Yeah, with Knoxville, the stadium is right, on the river. The stadium in the river is right there. Yeah. So when they took the goalposts, they basically just had to walk out of the stadium and dump them. Right. These kids had to go on a light on a light trek across <laughs> yeah. na- across Metro Nashville to get them into the river through the through, bachelorette parties down yeah, across dozens Lower Broadway. Of bachelorette parties. The oh, one good the, thing, the one good thing, again, if you don't know the National Train, it was all downhill. Because Vandy, like okay, Midtown yeah. is up on a hill and then you go down to the river. So you didn't actually have to like navigate any hills. It was, mm-hmm. a, you know, a really nice shot for them to get down there. But still two and a half miles. And the fact that like they picked up a police escort along mm-hmm. the way, um, people were cheering them on on lower <laughs> Broadway. Um, it was just it was just a thing of beauty mm-hmm. all the way around. And I, I told my husband, like, this is what college football is meant to be absolutely right in those moments of like everybody was just in on it and was like we're just gonna let this happen and just make sure nobody gets seriously hurt mm-hmm. yeah. and there were a couple of minor injuries aj mentioned a car got dinged on the, but like remarkable considering how large these things are and they were going through the busiest section of downtown right. on the busiest night of the of the week which is saturday nights mm-hmm. um that they that everybody just made this happen. Bravo to all involved um for, for making that happen and, and for reminding us all why college football is the best sport on the planet. Absolutely. Um, 
it was it was just a, a wonderful and to be in the city where that happened and to go to church on Sunday morning. My church is literally right across the street from Vanderbilt Stadium. We <laughs> sell our parking lot uh -huh. for people to go to the game nice. um, and to have people walking up, giving each other high fives. The, the amount of black and gold in our sanctuary on Sunday was a bit absurd. Um, everybody like wearing their like you're going to mass in Pittsburgh on a Sunday. It was. Yeah, that's, that's Pittsburgh mass. What are you talking about? I know. <laughs> I have a whole wardrobe black, with black, black and gold that I can wear up front in church. Don't don't, don't okay. at me on that. Like okay. I've, I've got that covered. But yeah, the people walking around each other, giving themselves the you know the VU sign um, everywhere was just a beautiful thing. AJ, what was your Vanderbilt Alabama experience? Uh, I was hanging out with my son. Mm -hmm. We were uh, watching videos. Uh, he was playing Rocket League down here and discovered that playing with a keyboard and mouse for a year on his computer and then mm -hmm. trying to go to an Xbox controller doesn't work out for him. Oh, boy. Yep, that's a jump. Uh, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a jump. And then uh, we went to Los Mariachis in Moon, okay. uh, where we had the the, the, the taco meetup. Uh, I was not really paying. Like, I was paying light attention. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I look over and I see Vandy in victory formation. I went, wait, wait, hold <laughs> In the in the restaurant, it, no, the, we weren't in the restaurant. I think we were okay. still at home at that point. What's I don't even remember what time the game was. That day was a blur. Um, but I just remember sitting there going, "Are oh, they really doing this? They're really doing." Vandy beat <laughs> Bama. Vandy has taken down out, and I think this is the thing that when people go like, "Who are the blue bloods of the sport?" Mm -hmm. This is why Bama shows up because mm -hmm. when Bama loses a game. And especially over the last 15 years. Yeah. When Bama loses a game, it turns into the end scene from Return of the Jedi, where all the Ewoks are dancing and they just start cutting to like, here's here's the like Empire City of Karusikon. Everybody's cheering, and there's fireworks, <laughs> they're on Tatooine, they got a third son somehow. Uh -huh. And everybody's just thrilled that it, that Alabama lost. Mm -hmm. And so seeing that it was Bandy that did it, and not it's not like like, if Georgia had beaten Alabama, it would have been like, oh, it was a hard fart game. Vandy beats it. Let's get these memes going. Yes. Right? The <laughs> yep. meme factory fires up for Vandy, for Vandy winning. And I, I think this is, it is a massive upset, both in terms of the history of this, mm -hmm. but also in terms of everything that people believe about the sport of college football. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like when people look at a conference, they go, "How are these teams in the same conference?" Vandy and Alabama is the one everybody comes to immediately. Yeah, yeah. you can joke about like Ohio State and Indiana, and mm -hmm. not this year. Not but you can no. usually joke about like Rutgers and Ohio State or um, Northwestern has always been Northwestern's always been Northwestern has always been 10. one too. So do you have schools in various conferences where it's like this is clearly the good team and this is clearly the bad mm -hmm. team, and it's always been this is the bad team, this is the good team. It's rare recently, especially with Vandy getting up and beating somebody. Mm -hmm. And to do with Alabama, a reminder that we shouldn't have been as surprised as we were because they took Missouri to double overtime yep. yeah. the yep. week before, right? This is this is something that I think Vandy is a good football team. This mm -hmm. isn't like, a, oh, one in five Vandy jumps up and gets Alabama and beats them in this like weird fluky game. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Vandy is a good football team and they beat the breaks off of Alabama. No, they beat them no in flukiness. every phase of the game. No flukiness um, at all. Yeah. Uh, Carla, as a parent, you're going to recognize this. Uh, Alabama's time of possession was two Bluey episodes. <laughs> Bluey episodes are eight minutes a piece. Ah. Alabama's time of possession was 16 minutes. That's two Bluey episodes. <laughs> Um, That's... it was, it was a lot okay. and they did it by just straight up beating them and also doing the thing that we'll talk about Cal in a moment mm -hmm. here, not letting up. They mm -hmm. never let up. They mm -hmm. said, we're going to play until the bell until th there is literally not a chance that we can lose this game. Right. They didn't get, they didn't get scared at the end. Bama tried to just kind of scare them back with talent and. They rose to the occasion and they said, no, we're going to, we're going to still play the exact same way all the way through. Okay. We, uh, I, normally at this point of the show, we would, we would recap what we saw and, you know, we both, uh, all three of us got to, 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 to pay attention to some stuff that was happening on Saturday on a crazy Saturday. Um, yeah. But we wanted to spend some more time on this. Uh, and Carla lined up someone who can offer us some some legitimate perspective about what happens when Vanderbilt beats Alabama? Let's take a look at that. 
We wanted to get a little extra context to this upset, um, it, it being as monumental as it, is, as it is. So Carla got in touch with someone who is as plugged into Vanderbilt Athletics as anybody on the planet, national resident and uh, best-selling author Andrew Moranis, uh, whose book Strong Inside about the player who desegregated men's basketball at Vandy uh, is, is still required reading on the subject. Andrew, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for uh, getting in touch. I'm so happy to talk about this game on Saturday. I, I bet. I bet. Especially since you were there, correct? I was there with my 14-year-old daughter, mm -hmm. and we uh, watched the game together. We stormed the field together. We <laughs> peeled off pieces of the yellow paint from the goalpost together. It was a <laughs> one of those moments I felt like I can die happy now. You know? <laughs> oh, man. That's absolutely. That would be That would be an incredible experience. Uh, to to start with, as you're as you're watching this come together, at what point did it occur to you that that Vandy might actually pull this out? Oh, that's a that's a good question. Every Vanderbilt game that I've ever been to for the last well, since 1988 season mm -hmm. when I was a freshman there, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've had hope going into every single one of those games, even when they went one and ten twice while I was a student you know and and back then my attitude was as long as we're within seven to ten points like this is still a game you know mm -hmm. and so I would have hope going into every game and early in every game this year the traffic was actually so bad getting into the stadium that I was walking through the portal out to our seats right as Vandy scored their first touchdown. So it was, Ooh, wow. okay. you're already winning when I got there. <laughs> Seven to nothing. Great start. And pretty quickly after that, there was a pick six. And, uh, you know, we're up 13 to nothing because we missed the extra point. And, I mean, at that point, I started to think maybe we could actually win this game. You know, uh, maybe that was outsized confidence. But <laughs> I, I think the, uh, the team felt that way. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, watching this game, I felt like um, the team approached it like that they could win this thing, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it wasn't a fluky game. Um, no. If you watched it or you see the replays, I mean, there's runs right up the gut, right through the Alabama defense. Um, third down conversions, one after another. Like, uh, I know Clark Lee talks about, like, complimentary football. Mm -hmm. It was offense, defense, and special teams that all played well. I mean, it just felt like a complete game. I was a little nervous when Alabama scored coming out of halftime and cut mm -hmm. it to two points. Where we were sitting, if you saw the game and there's the, the fourth and one and they they throw it right down the middle uh, mm -hmm. in the end zone for a touchdown, we were on that end of the field. And um, at that point, I lost my mind. Like, I think at that point, was if you had to really pinpoint when I thought we were going to win, right. Um, screaming at the top of my lungs, jumping up and down. My daughter, I think, had never seen her dad do that before. So <laughs> probably a little startling for her. But that's that's probably the true moment where I was like, wow, this this could really happen. Okay. Carly, you have questions. Yeah. So thinking um about the 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 Nashville side of things before we get into kind of like the the bigger picture stuff here. Um having you know watched the game I was here at home um, but then watching the aftermath on social media of pulling, you know, pulling the goalposts down and like marching them down Broadway. Um, and Nashville seemed to like be all in on this, right? Like everybody just kind of let this happen, which <laughs> is kind of a rare thing, <laughs> to be honest. And so I'm just kind of curious as to like, you know, having sitting at Vanderbilt, but understanding like the context of what's happening in Nashville too, like how big of a situation was this um, having been there, but more thinking about like the city of Nashville, you had that interesting post about it felt like Nashville took Nashville back for a couple yeah. of hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd be curious. Yeah. What that you was what really that. struck me about watching that. Um, and I was not marching down the street. <laughs> I was watching <laughs> on Twitter and TikTok and everything, but just to see these videos of the, the students carrying that goalpost two and a half miles down to the Cumberland, dumping it in the river. Um, the police cars that were pulled over essentially to the side of the road, uh, you know, imagining these kids walking past all the, the pedal taverns and the stupid tractors that pull people around, you know, <laughs> um, for me, that's one aspect of Nashville's growth and change that I don't like, you know, that, that we've kind of lost downtown and it's a, a tourist, uh, trap in a way and not even interesting tourists or trap in terms of 
some of that like transpotainment uh, aspect of it, right? Yeah. Um, it's good for a city to have a, a thriving downtown. I'm not saying that. And it's tourism is great too, but, but like this type of it is a little annoying, right? And it doesn't seem authentic to the city. It's kind of like a, a version of Nashville that other people want to perpetuate, right? And yeah. so to see a bit of what I called authentic Nashville, like this school that's been here since the 1870s and the students kind of uh, reclaiming that, you know, uh, marching the goalposts down to the river. Um, in, I said it was injecting a piece of authentic uh, Nashville into this part of the city that doesn't seem like it belongs to Nashville anymore. Uh, so that was really interesting to me. I think another piece that goes into that is as a Vanderbilt fan, you know, you have a little bit of a chip on your shoulder that even our city isn't always a Vanderbilt city, right? Like right. it's a Tennessee city, a University of Tennessee, um, or, and I've moved here from out of state, you know, to go to college here. So I'm, I'm one of those people, but there's so many people from other parts of the country too, who have their own teams that they bring with them. The Titans experienced that. I was on the other side of that a couple of weeks ago as one of the many Packer fans taking over uh, Nissan <laughs> stadium. Yeah. And I loved it, but you know, but you go to a Vandy football game, it was mostly Alabama fans there. Um, so even at this momentous game, this glorious game, like it was mostly the other team's fans and to see um, Vanderbilt sort of staking a claim in downtown Nashville after the game, it just meant a lot to me. And yeah. it, it seemed like it did to a lot of other people too, because it was just a, I don't always get a reaction to tweets, but that one got a lot of reaction. And it was pretty cool yeah. to see that a lot of people other uh, other people resonated with that. Well, and shout out to Mayor O'Connell, um, who actually is also a friend um, and who had that post about the Cumberland being at low tide. Low um, tide. That was a good line. Yeah, yeah, it was. That was a good post, as was Nashville severe weather. If it's Nashville severe weather is one of the few reasons to stay on Twitter um, because they protect us all um, when when severe weather rolls through. And they posted a, a, a radar image of downtown and circled Broadway and the Cumberland and posted clear, clear skies, full heart. And just left it at that. <laughs> um, so it, all the major national players kind of started jumping in on this. And that was it was a rare scene of unity from a lot of different aspects. And it was just kind of a beautiful thing. The the, the scanner, the police scanner that they've now released from that night is hilarious. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of, yeah, that's great. Of I everybody. That's just, you know, they're just pulling everybody down. They're just like, let them go to the river. They're going to the river. Just let them go. And then you mm -hmm. hear the call. The posts are in the river. Repeat posts in the river. <laughs> and it's. It's just a beautiful thing. The, the, really uh, like the infrared helicopter footage. Yes. Of, yeah. <laughs> yes. It's the whole thing. <laughs> but, you know, I think that um, and there were a lot of like Jelly Roll and Shibuzi and a lot of uh, Nate Bargatze. He was on SNL that night doing the start, the, you know, VU sign with his hand. And you realize like you're the flavor of the minute. Right. And so um, how long will that last? you hope it lasts a long time. You know, I hope they go to Kentucky and win. And this is a beginning mm -hmm. of something, not just a one-time thing, you know, um, but you'll take the attention uh, while you can. Yeah. Um, I, I did, Carlin, I, you and I were, we, you talked about this. Where, where would you, where, where does this rank kind of in, in Vanderbilt athletics in, in the, in the history of, uh, of the Commodores, um, Obviously, yeah. baseball baseball has been a big deal at the school. Uh, basketball on and off. Um, where 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 would you rank this one? That's a good question because uh, you know, as you mentioned, baseball has won national championships. Mm -hmm. uh, ten women's tennis has won a national championship. Yep. Uh, women's bowling has won three national championships. We just had an Olympian. You know, um, had other uh, a golf national champion, mm -hmm. track national champion. So, how do you say? a regular season game is more significant than a national championship. I could, I could understand that argument. Um, football team has won bowl games. Like mm -hmm. someone might say that that's more significant, but I would say that uh, as a single game and as a single moment and feeling, this is the most significant event in Vanderbilt athletics history. Okay. Um Possibly, I think that Tim Corbin would argue with that, you know, for sure, the uh, baseball coach. But even those baseball championships, like we were the best team in the country maybe going into Omaha. So it didn't have that same 
feeling that this did mm -hmm. and people relate to the underdog right in mm -hmm. a way that captured the attention of the of the country and being at the game i didn't really realize how the the story of you know i think pat 40 wrote a great article about being in the parking lot after was it the ohio state game maybe i don't know mm -hmm. but you know seeing people there that had come for a different game and were watching the end of the vandy alabama yep. game you know you hear yep. stories about people all over the country that were it's like an NCAA tournament where everybody starts rooting for the underdog, right? And so you weren't really conscious of that when you're sitting at, there at the game. And I've been picking up on that after. And so I think in that respect, as a game that kind of everybody knows happened mm -hmm. and was a fun upset that most people were rooting for the underdog. Vandy's never beaten a number one team in football before. Mm -hmm. Hadn't beaten Alabama since 1984. Hadn't beaten Alabama in Nashville since 1969. But Alabama wasn't number one then. Right. So um, I would say this is the most important game. Okay. AJ, do you have yeah. questions? I, and I guess, you know, kind of given that this is the biggest moment in Vanderbilt history, if you think through, you know, various large upsets, where do you feel like this game ranks in sort of the pantheon <laughs> of large upsets? Things like you have App State Michigan is the one that immediately comes to mind for most people. Yeah, um, kind of where do you see this fitting into there? Yeah, that's a good question, too, because as big of an upset as it was, I don't think this is a bad Vanderbilt team, you know, and right. I don't think it was a fluky game. Um, App State, Michigan, you know, App State even playing that kind of a they're not they weren't a power five. I don't know if it was called power five back no, then. No, they were know? an FCS team. They were, they were, they were, yeah. they were guys, yeah. one, one double A was, but yeah, they was were called back then. G5. So, yeah. I mean, Vanderbilt's an SEC team that beat Virginia Tech earlier this year. So, mm -hmm. like, um, I don't think it's that type of upset in terms of the um, mismatch, but in terms of the uh, just other people's perception of what Vanderbilt is, what mm -hmm. Vanderbilt has been prior seasons. Um, so, I wouldn't – actually, I wouldn't put it up there as a bigger upset than App State over Michigan. Um, you know, or uh, Vanderbilt's an SEC team – like I say, that as uh, as a winning record right now, as trying to go to a bowl game, Diego Pavia, I think, is one of the most exciting players in college football right now. So his play, you know, wasn't fluky. Um, Vanderbilt was running the ball right up the middle through the Alabama defense. I mean, I, I think if you watch the game, you didn't know the backstories of the teams. You would think these were pretty evenly matched teams, you know. Um, so for that reason, I, I don't think it's as literally as big of an upset as App State. I think this one happened in the social media era. True. You know, and there's no bigger, uh, with respects to an interviewer wearing Ohio State gear, I think that the uh, <laughs> Alabama football is like the Yankees or the mm -hmm. Lakers, or I'm a Packers fan, the Packers or the Cowboys, you know. And so anytime the number one Alabama goes down, especially to a school like Vandy, it's going to get a lot of attention. Yeah. Because Go ahead. Go ahead. What do you guys think? I mean, am I wrong? Am I like seeing this through no. black and gold colored glasses? I don't, or... <laughs> I don't think so either. I think I think you're absolutely right. You're talking about two teams. Both are in the SEC. Both have you know P5 TV money. <clears throat> the difference is App State is an FCS school, even though they were a national championship level school. Mm -hmm. They were still an FCS school with lower money coming into the big house and beating Michigan to open the season. That's a massive, that's, that's one of those things that literally people remember forever. I think the thing that makes this, it puts it into that pantheon is just that the history of mm -hmm. Vandy and Alabama in particular, yeah. most people, when they look at, when they talk about like two schools and how far apart they could be, most people talk about Alabama and Vandy. They're like, Alabama is, as you mentioned, the Yankees of college football, right? They are always very good. I could make some arguments as to Ohio State actually is the Yankees, but we can have that as a different discussion. <laughs> but as you as you look at the history of the SEC and the history of Alabama and the history of v Vandy football, they're not in the same categories generally. Right. <laughs> and so seeing this win is massive. By the way, listeners to the show, we told you about Diego Pavia. Yep. We've been on Diego Pavia train for about three him for a while. years now <laughs> when he was with New Mexico State. Okay. The legend of Diego Pavia grows every time. Um, and they're absolutely this... beating Auburn now. Like, that's not even a question. <laughs> <laughs> that's, Don't put well, certainties into the air. Of it. You know, like to go to this team, this Fandy team, mm -hmm. 
you want to see them go to a bowl game, right? And so yeah, they absolutely. still have to win three more games. They only have one more non-conference game. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's not a, a foregone conclusion that's going to happen. So they're going to have to have a couple more upsets. Um, and but I feel like they're. Uh, this team has kind of set a tone where where that stuff is achievable. Um, oh yeah, and for it, sure. And, and as you look at the look at the schedule, um, Auburn is one that we've been we've been talking about all season, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, but I I feel like it's doable now. So oh, I totally think it's doable. I mean, imagine they beat number one. And they've also got another number one coming in in a couple of weeks with mm-hmm. Texas. Yeah, mm-hmm. Texas um, comes to Texas comes <laughs> in in a couple of weeks. You got, I think. Kentucky, you have to beat Kentucky, yeah, to make yeah. this possible. You have Ball State, who's currently one and four, and mm-hmm. not Here's good. One. Um, there's another one. You have uh, Auburn and South at mm-hmm. Auburn and home with South Carolina at the start of November. And other than that, you have number one Texas, currently number thirteen LSU, and currently number eight Tennessee. <laughs> um, it, it, there's there's uh, there's some lows and there's some <laughs> big things coming on. Uh, the funny part though is Diego Pavia is on this like weird Hugh Freeze revenge tour, where he <laughs> beat right. Hugh Freeze at New, Me- as New at New Mexico State when Hugh Freeze was at Liberty, and then they beat him again last year when they went to, when they went into Auburn, and then this year he and Jerry Kill come to Vandy and they're going to play Auburn again. He is the scourge of Alabama. <laughs> he I, is. I've been referring whole, to him as the, the scourge of state. Alabama. <laughs> mm-hmm. The whole state. He's like, he's got smoke for the whole state. <laughs> he does. And he's oh. he's got a lot of swagger too. It's yeah. fun to yeah. to see. <laughs> Can we find him another year of eligibility somewhere? That's my question. That would I know. Be, I would love be, to see that. That'd be, good, that'd be a good thing. <laughs> I said, let me ask you one more more one more thing here. Thinking about the like you talked about that you go to a Vanderbilt football game. So I've been to several, um, and you end up with a stadium that is three quarters of the opposing team's fans, right? And that's just kind of what you know that that's the reputation that Vandy had. Um, what does a win like this mean, not just for like Vandy football moving forward, but like Vandy athletics moving forward? Because this is one of those moments, you know, kind of like when, you know, when the Vandy boys win a national title out in Omaha, you know, like that, that put that raises Vandy a little bit. But, you know, mm-hmm. you sit in Van- you sit in the athletics office, right? And understanding like, what does that do for your, for, for your program as a whole? Yeah, I think it does a lot. You know, um, it's not because people don't care. Uh, you know, P- Vandy fans are as passionate as any other schools. It's a small school, less than 7,000 undergraduates. Um, most of those students are coming from all sorts, other parts of the country. <laughs> they don't necessarily stay in Nashville after they graduate. So there isn't the sort of automatic uh, fan base there might be for other SEC schools, you know, where you're born into being an Alabama fan or an Auburn fan. Um and so a challenge is to become Nashville's team, you know, and that people that don't have any automatic association with Vanderbilt uh, adopt the team as their own because it's the hometown team. Mm-hmm. And I think games like Saturday are important in trying to achieve that, you know. Yeah. Um, and so that that would be my hope is that people saw that atmosphere after the game. They're like, I want to be a part of that, you know, and that they do come to the next home game against Ball State, and they're there for the other home games. Um, the other problem, though, and the Titans face this too, is Nashville is such a fun place to visit <laughs> that it's a great weekend for visiting mm-hmm. fans. I'm sure there's going to be a ton of fans from Texas that are coming to you know their first SEC game in Nashville um, who already have tickets. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know that it's something that changes overnight, but – I do think that um, Clark Lee is a great coach and he's building something um, sustainable. And so I think Monday's game could be a real um, catalyst for grabbing more attention uh, here in Nashville. The student section was great on Saturday. There's been years where I've been really disappointed in the student turnout and wondering like back in my day, you know, like you just went to games. That was part of being a student. Of course you would go to the game, but whether it's basketball or football, talking to students in recent years, they'll say like, we've got so many other things we can possibly do in Nashville, or it's hard to get off our phone, <laughs> you know, like make me come. What's the reason why I have to come to a game? And it's felt different this year where they've been there uh, for all three games so far and really having fun. And I know that they're going to be strong uh, for the rest of the season. Okay. 
Guys, listen, you can find Andrew at uh, andrewmoranis.com. Uh, there you'll you'll find more info about his books, uh, his blog, his social links, uh, and a bunch of other stuff. Andrew, this has been fantastic, and uh, we really appreciate it. It's been great to talk to you. Uh, we really appreciate you helping us kind of put this, this into perspective. Hope you enjoy the rest of the season. Well, thanks, man. I hope you do, too. Uh, <laughs> my grandparents on my mom's side are Ohio State alums. Love um, it. Got a lot of Big Ten in our family. My parents went to Wisconsin. My sister went to okay. Northwestern. So, uh, you know, I'm you, the you one know that's that's well. the SEC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, right, thank well, you, very, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Take care. Again, uh, the thank you to Andrew for uh, joining us. That was a uh, uh, fantastic. Uh, his answers were were, uh, were were terrific. And Carla, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to arrange that. That was very cool. Of course. Yeah. It's good to have friends in high places. <laughs> absolutely absolutely what um, if you have friends in low places then, then i would be on lower broadway the goalposts doesn't garth brooks have is that his own does he have does he have yeah. a thing on broadway no no, no garth okay. brooks is too good to have a stupid bar on broadway okay <laughs> okay and I, I i'm if um, garth knows better <laughs> um hey just for those who, those of you who listen to this podcast and you wonder yes. when we record this stuff Tuesday. Um, <clears throat> it is Tuesday evening, the eighth, mm -hmm. and it is there is currently one minute and sixteen seconds left in the fourth quarter, and FIU and Liberty are tied. Oh, all I'm really? saying is nice. All I'm saying is, all I'm saying is, Dale. <laughs> you guys, you guys will recall that uh, during the month of November, um, my Bobcats are often playing on Tuesday when we are recording this, and I get a little distracted. Um, so yeah, this that is we we have reached the point of the season where there is actually college football going on on Tuesday nights while we're taping. So you know if um if our if we miss an answer or our eyes are kind of glazed looking over to the side or something, that that's an excellent. That could be why. That could be why. Um, Let's go Panthers. This weekend, unlike last weekend, has a lot of stuff that on paper looks to be fantastic. The games that um. The, the big games that we're going to talk about, uh, is a, it is a great list, but we're going to start, as we always do, with AJ and his group of five After Dark Report, which um, we've come to appreciate it being delivered live. Yes. So, AJ, yes. go. Uh, all right, then we're going to start on Thursday, because okay. it's 7.30 on ESPN2. We have Coastal Carolina at James Madison, four and one Sun Belt teams playing each other. JMU, though. Is 0-1 in the Sun Belt. Why are they 0-1 in the Sun Belt? It's because they lost in fun row to your 4-1 ULM Warhawks. Um, that was an interesting game. Mm -hmm. uh, ULM kind of did the same thing that Vandy did. They got up early, and they didn't let up. Yeah, And it is uh, that is kind of the key to a lot of upsets, especially the ones that we've – seen this year of it's not really been like a, oh this is a weird fluky game and a ball got fumbled in the wrong way or whatever it's been the games that are upsets are upsets mm -hmm. they are just you lost that game mm -hmm. um jamie's favored by nine and a half the fun index is a proper 60 and a half mm -hmm. um jmu has looked really good all year and ulm is the first team to really make them look mortable um Coastal is four and one. They're actually not bad this year, mm -hmm. but they also kind of have a an ain't played nobody schedule. Um, they played Jacksonville State, William and Mary, Temple, Virginia, and ODU. It's not like Coastal's been beating the the you know beating the best of the best here. Mm -hmm. uh, JMU obviously hung seventy on UNC. They beat Ball State sixty three to seven before they lost to ULM. Um, this should be a very very fun game. Okay. And I highly recommend you watch it. I'm getting, I'm going to take James Madison to get a win at home, get back on track, uh, and continue to make their run for the Sun Belt Championship. Crappy, what do you got? Uh, give me Jimmy. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the same. I'm I'm leaning Jimmy in this, but better win. So far, uh, they need to. Um, but uh, the entertainment, the entertainment um, quotient here, I think, is as you said, AJ is uh, very promising. Yes. Uh, Carla, I need you to weigh in. I've not watched a ton of middle Tennessee football this year. Forgive me. 
8 p.m. on CBSSN. The network of what? Champions. 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 That's right. Uh, in Ruston, Louisiana, we have Middle Tennessee State going to Louisiana Tech. These teams are one and four and one and three, respectively. It's not been a great year for either of these teams so far. Uh, Tech favored by five. Fun Index is 49 and a half. Carla, what am I supposed to make of this? Well, I mean, as as a middle fan, you you hope that the ship gets righted at a game like this. Um, and you can make a pretty valid argument here that middle has played a tougher schedule so far mm-hmm. this year as opposed to La Tech. I mean, middle's top of season stuff has just been absolutely brutal. Um, playing a lot of, um, you know, bigger teams, um, you know, going to the uh, at Memphis, bringing Duke in for homecoming, you know, and then and dealing with weather issues. Every home game has been impacted by rain delay in some way. Um, so it's just been kind of a mess to Derek Mason's start. So you hope that this is a get right game for them down in Ruston. Um, here's the thing. If, if middle doesn't win this game, getting to a bowl becomes exceptionally hard. Um, and so this is almost in a week seven, this is almost a must win game for middle, um, to be able to get to those six wins. So the, the, the thing we haven't seen, or the, the problem that middle has had is, um, second half lapses. They, they've jumped out to, to early leads in the first half and then just kind of, I don't know, take a recess in the third quarter. And it's really frustrating as a fan to watch that happen. So Derek's got to get these guys ready to come out after the half and play as fired up if they enter the half with a lead. And I hope they do, but you know, I'm picking middle. Come on. Yeah. I mean, I mean, my it's it's not the, it's not the top or the bottom. We're here in the middle, baby. <laughs> um, it's not uh, it's not bottom Tennessee State. No. Um, you know, I give me middle too. Uh, I think I think uh, I think Louisiana Tech is they're fine. I think mm-hmm. the problem is you're right, Carla. Middle has played a bunch of tough football teams. They got pantsed by Ole Miss. They lost at home in the 100 miles of hate. Don't call it anything other than that. And then you have Duke and Memphis. Like, these are good football teams. Western Kentucky beat Boston College. These are good, good football teams. And they hung in there, especially with Western, for a little bit there. Mm -hmm. I think this is their get-right game. Then they get Kennesaw State, Jacksonville State. I think this is a good time for Middle to kind of right the ship, go into uh, a, a lackluster. They're getting the bottom four the four teams that are with them at the bottom of the CUSA over the next four weeks. Well, so it's not even I, that like, the, because we're in CUSA action, right? When we talked to former yep. coach Rick Stock still about this last summer, the turnaround right now is insane. Middle plays Thursday night, and then they are home on Tuesday to yeah. Kennesaw. They mm-hmm. have a three day layover mm-hmm. um, to play a home game. Um, so this is going to be a really telling stretch um, for the Blue Raiders for sure. I, um, uh, just I, a reminder on the flip side of that, the, yeah. after they play uh, a team that is currently in overtime against Florida International, um, they get a two-week break before playing New Mexico State at home. So yes. I think there's that's, that's kind right. of the way that they've done this is it's a short window to get into it, and then they get a long break on the way out. Okay. Yep. I would I'd look at um, Middle Tennessee's schedule, and that's, that's vexing for anyone, uh, any team in D1. Um, so... I think Middle's going to be prepared for this run through CUSA. Um, and uh, that that is going to start with the win at La Tech. Let's go blue. No. I, uh, God. I was on mute. It God pains dang. me. It pains me. Pains me every time. <laughs> it's just a color. And it's not even the same one. You could say go <laughs> royal blue. That'd be you fine. Say- I, I'd, I'd be perfectly happy with it. I can it's, say it even. Go Royal Blue. Yes. See? There you go. Go Damn. Royal Blue. Yes. Royal. We're here for the we're here for proper go, royalty. Go such Royal. as Middle Tennessee. Are we flashing back to Lord here. Is that what we're doing? <laughs> yes. <here>? Lord, <laughs> Lord Middle Tennessee State. <laughs> Lord Mitsu, my, my leash. <laughs> no, I was referring to the the song. Yeah. Royals. Yes. Never never mind. Yeah. Uh, oh. Some of you are too young to get that reference. No. no. Oh. oh. No, I caught it. I caught it. There's, oh, man, there's so many layers that Lord Royal. Friday night, 8, 8 p.m. on Fox. Who wants to talk about Northwestern Maryland? Not me. At 10 30 p.m. <laughs> at 10 30 p.m. on ESPN. This is actually one of the bigger games we wanted to cover. We have number 16 yep. Utah at Arizona State. Carla, yeah. does anybody like going to the desert? Absolutely not. No, no one likes going to the desert. Utah at home 
they brought the desert home. They said, mm-hmm. we have the desert at home. And they brought Arizona in, and it did not go well for them. Uh, first loss of the season, they didn't look good in the process. Uh, Isaac Wilson, who was their uh, replacement for Cam Rising, uh, he's iffy. <laughs> It's a difference between, you know, you got a freshman quarterback and like a seven year starter or whatever in camp rising. So, you know, there's an experience level difference. I think Utah's favored by six, Bonnie Dex is 45 and a half. I think Arizona State gets up for this game. Mm-hmm. They're mm-hmm. at home. They've been on the road. They've played a bunch of really dumb games. They're still four and one, but they've played a bunch of really dumb, clunky games where they just figure out a way to win. I think they can make a statement win. Give me the Devils to win on Friday night. Crappy, who you got? I at this point, I think it's we need to assume that that Utah is for all intents and purposes uh, without Cam Rising for the for the season, um, and that's probably for the best that you, that you don't rely on a thirty seven year old quarterback in playing college football anyway. Um, but they miss him. Uh, mm-hmm. You you reference certainly the the experience level between uh, between uh, Rising and Wilson, um, and that that was evidenced by the loss at home last week against the other Arizona team. Um, can State complete the uh, the Arizona sweep of the state of Utah? Um, that they they've looked pretty good so far. Um, Workman like wins, but but wins uh, get to getting to four and one. They run the ball well, but that strength goes against Utes, the Utes' strength. It's defense. Yeah. I got to pick you, Tom. That's fair. Yeah, it's like you can make an argument, and this is really weird because you can make an argument that Arizona State hasn't really played anyone with substance yet this season. And that's really weird to say when you see that they have wins over Kansas, Mississippi State, and Wyoming. Like going into the season, we would have said had they won those games that they would be nationally ranked at this point. But those teams have all underperformed this year off of off of expectations here. And the win over Kansas last week required a freaking miracle um, <laughs> to be able to pull that win out in the last possession, right? Um but like like Crappy said, I mean, the Forks have one of the best run offenses in the entire conference at this point. Um, two twenty on the ground per game. Mm-hmm. I, that that's insane for mm-hmm. for a Big Twelve team on the ground. Um, they have and, noted Minecraft character Camp Scatterboat running back kind of helps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and like you said, I mean, last time we saw the Utes, they were losing to the other team in Minnesota or in um, Arizona, and so. But again, it's that Utah defense. <sighs> This game's gonna be tight. This game's gonna be real tight. I'm gonna. Mm-hmm. I think I will get. I always give the edge to defense here. Um, that's usually defense wins championships. So I lean Utah in this. I lean the Utes. That this feels like it could be a get right game. I'd feel a heck of a lot better about it if it was in Salt Lake, though. Um, for sure. But um, I think I think the Sun Devils give them a run for their money here, literally, um, and could actually pull this one off. I, but yeah, I'll take the Utes officially. But I don't feel good about it. I think uh, I think this is just a reminder. It's going to be ninety five degrees kickoff. Um, yeah. It's seven thirty p.m. It's amazing what the desert does. I, this is this is an interesting game that would have been a Pac twelve game last year. It's a Big Twelve game this year. Um, I, I'm, I'm interested to see if Utah can kind of right the ship here, but I'm still taking the Devils on Saturday. Got a couple nooners. I want to start. At the bottom of the Mac, baby, on ESPN Plus, we have Ball State at Kent State. Ball State is favored by seven and a half. We have a, a proper fund index of 59 and a half. This is the battle for not being the bottom of the Mac. <laughs> um, Kent State might be the fully worst team in FBS. Um, the, athletic, is, the Athletic does its rankings of every team in FBS. Uh, and since, I think, week two, uh, Kent has been dead last. And Ball State has played a bunch of hard games. Mm-hmm. Uh, they got they got destroyed by JMU, as mentioned earlier, 63-7. I think Kent State has an opportunity to get a win here. This is probably their best chance of getting a win, is against Ball State. Mm-hmm. They are at home. They're at noon. They're playing on a Saturday. It's Mac football on a Saturday. Who knew that was allowed? I think there's an opportunity for Kent State to get a win here. And I'm going to take Kent State. I'm going to take the flashes to get a win in conference play against Ball State. Carla, who you got? Uh, I don't know. I ball. I, I think I lean Ball State here. Um, they they seem to be the better team on paper, anyways. So, yeah, Ball State. 
Crappy, who you got? Kent's last outing, uh, they true they gave up uh 52 points to Eastern Michigan, um, but they scored 33. Um, ha- have they figured something out? Um, can they take advantage of playing at home? Um, will Kent students show up? I, I, I don't know. Um, I think this is the week. I think this is the week that uh, that Kent State comes through um, and wins its first game of the season. I love that. You know what I don't love? Hmm. FIU fumbling in overtime and losing the game. Oh. Um, Liberty is in full-blown FAFO mode. This is the family podcast. Don't you can look it up. They're in full blown FAFO mode and they're going to find out soon. I believe in it. Hopefully, in Murfreesboro. Uh, mm, I would love that. <laughs> uh, also, noon, ESPNU, we have Toledo at Buffalo. Mm-hmm. Uh, Toledo favored at nine, favored by nine and a half. Fun index is 44 and a half. This is for this has conference lead implications. And as a reminder, uh, the G5 champions do have a shot at a playoff spot. So winning the conference, at least getting into the conference championship game and winning your conference gives you the best, gives you an actual opportunity at this 12 team college football playoff. It's hard for me to pick against Toledo. Uh, Buffalo did beat NIU and it wasn't close, but I feel like I got to go with the Rockets here uh, in Buffalo to go in and get the win. Crappy who you got. Um, I uh, Buffalo has been, and up and down uh in in the in mid american conference play uh recently they they've they've had a couple dominating years uh they've had a couple years where you know you look at them and it's like yeah okay that's a that's going to be a win uh certainly the win against niu is a big deal um but toledo has been the class of the conference for the for the last 3 or 4 years um the rockets are going to win this one yeah i can i concur i think that's a that's a toledo win on the road um it might have different opinions if this game was in November, um, potentially. True. Um, but in mid October, yeah, no, this this feels like Toledo on the road. We're gonna stay at noon, and I I I have to ask you guys a question. Hmm? Do you want to see a dead body? <laughs> because on CBSSN, the network of champions, we have UAB at Army. Um <laughs> Army favored by 25 and a half American points. Uh, your fun index is 54 and a half. This is a reminder that UAB lost to Tulane 70 to 21 last week. Um, by the way, Trent Dilfer, you're an absolute clown for taking timeouts when you're down by 50 with a minute left. Who's that for? Uh, Who was that for? Just let the knees happen and end the game, you yeah. dork. Um, I hope Army hangs 60 on him, truly. And honestly, give me Army to win just so we can say that Army can also slay a dragon. Take that, Marines. Carla, who you got? Um, it it got to be Army. This would get them the bowl eligibility, right? And, you know, here we are in the midpoint of October talking about potentially both Army and Navy going bowl eligible. So... This is one of the rare times in my life that I will say go Army. Army training, sir! I just need you all to know that he moved the mic away <laughs> to make that. He sent it all the way. That was, that was, there was something deep and traumatic that came out there. Uh, <laughs> honestly, I, there's, I, I hope Army beats the brakes off of him. Navy is off this week. Uh, and the Army Air Corps actually did get their first touchdown, and so we mm-hmm. can call them Air Force again. Okay, uh, sure. But the Army Air Corps, uh, they are playing. Who was it? It's 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 a real gross game at the end of the day today too. Uh, where where did the Air Force game go? Where are they? And then then I thought I just saw them again. Where did they go? This is this is stealth mode. This is how Air Force gets into stealth mode. Oh, they're at uh, New Mexico at 7 p.m. on True TV. We're not going to talk about that game. In okay. case you're wondering what Air Force is up to. I do want to finish this. There's a bunch of other games. Uh, I want you to keep your eyes on uh, 8 p.m. ESPNU Marshall at Georgia Southern. That should be fantastic. Marshall's favored by one, which means that's basically a pick em game. Yep. Keep your eyes on that one. I want to introduce a small new segment called How Will the Big 12 Eat Itself This Week? 
<laughs> um, the Big 12 as a conference is a weird it's here's the thing it is living up to what we all thought the big 12 would be which mm -hmm. is it's you took texas at texas and AM, AM goes to the sec you bring in the four corner schools and now all of a sudden the big 12 is like one tier of hate <laughs> everybody can beat everybody any yes. given saturday yes it's the Pac-12 South personified. Correct. If you. What if we made the whole conference out of Pac-12? Right. 3.30 p.m. ESPNU, we have Cincinnati UCF. This is an American game that is now a Big 12 game. UCF's favored by three. Fun index is 58 and a half. That's fun. Potentially mm -hmm. could eat itself there. Cincinnati not having a terrible year. UCF. Up and down. They lost to Florida. That was sad. We really wanted to see what would happen if Florida lost to UCF. Is that game happen. slated? Is that game slated for Orlando? Because that might get moved if that's the it case. is still currently on. They may have okay. to play it in a submarine because <laughs> yeah, it is honestly as of the schedule right now on Tuesday, given uh a very uh, hurricane Milton, which is currently cruising. Mm -hmm at uh speed across the gulf of mexico that game likely might get it will likely get moved uh mm -hmm. but that is in orlando as of the schedule right now um arizona byu 4 p.m on fox mm -hmm. byu's favored by four and a half arizona coming off of beating utah can they get the other side of the holy mm -hmm. i think the answer is yes mm -hmm. i think byu is byu is good but they've looked suspect at times they're playing in Provo during the daytime. So I don't know that they're at full power of, I don't know if the Cougar tails are fully powered at this point in the day. Fun sure. index is 49 and a half. I think Arizona makes this closer, but I think BYU comes out with a win here. They're going to get scared though. Okay. Like a good Mormon scare. Okay. 8 PM on Fox. We have Iowa state at WVU. This is the actual spooky game. Iowa mm -hmm. state. Yes, it is. You've looked great this year. You're favored by three and a half. You're going into Morgantown. Neil Brown might be saving his job game by game this year. There's so <laughs> many WVU fans who are upset that they're playing well because they wanted Neil Brown gone, and, but then they watch him win games, and they're like, damn it, we can't get rid of him now. So this one's the spooky one. I think WVU could get a win here mm -hmm. and change the course of some of the – some of the. Uh, some of what the Big 12 is, and this is where it really eats itself. Right now, uh, right. if you take the existing AP poll, Iowa State is the 11 seed mm -hmm. in the playoff. Mm -hmm. That's a real statement in the year of our Lord 2024. Mm -hmm. Iowa State mm -hmm. is the 11 seed. In... Can we talk about the fact that Iowa State would make the playoff before Iowa? That's hilarious. Uh, fun <laughs> index on that game is 52 and a half. Mm -hmm. There's one right there where potentially WVU get, jumps up and gets Iowa State. And I'll save the last Big 12 game, which is K-State of Colorado, for later on in the chronologic picks mm -hmm. of the game. And finally, uh, we do have a Hawaii test this week. Oh. And coming to the island, the murder smurfs themselves, Boise State. And when I first saw this game on the schedule, I said to myself, Ashton J Johnson's going to run for a 1,000 yards. Mm -hmm. He is averaging like 14 yards a carry. He's Already got a thousand yards rushing. The next running back is I was Caleb Johnson with like 750. He's like a full 200 yards ahead of the nearest running back. And he's been pulled in the second half twice. He has not played in the second half for right. two games already. Right. Uh, last week, he had a late 13 carries for 186 yards and three touchdowns. It is absurd <laughs> what he is doing. Um, I was expecting that. He would run for a thousand yards against my beloved Bose because what I've seen on defense from Hawaii has not looked great. And then I looked at the stats, and it turns out that Hawaii actually has the best defense in the Mountain West, and they actually have a properly good defense overall across all of FBS, putting them in company with Iowa, Duke, Memphis, mm -hmm. and um, I'm blanking on the fourth team now. But these are like good, proper Power 5 teams. Mm -hmm. I wonder if Hawaii is the first team to slow down Ashton Shanty. Oregon couldn't do it, but it was also the second game of the season, so they hadn't really seen a lot of him. Right. They've now got 
five games worth of film on him. Mm-hmm. Can yeah. Hawaii slow them down? I still think the Broncos win. As much as it pains me to say that, okay. Hawaii is on the big island. They almost beat San Diego State on the mainland. I still think the Broncos win. Carla, who you got in this game? You, you, you got to take Boise. Um, but I, th- I think maybe Hawaii can keep it close. I hope this turns into a points fest at 2 a.m. Because, by the way, Boise has also been putting like 60 on people yep. every yep. week. Yep. Um, and Hawaii is fully down to get into a, run, uh, a full run and gun situation here. And this Probably is not a this gone. is not a true Hawaii test either because they kick an hour early. True. Did they kick? Did they? Are they kicking this an hour? Kick, oh, it's kicking 11, 11, 11 p.m. PM not 11 midnight. PM. Man, I'm gonna get an early bedtime, you guys. I'm, gonna <laughs> I'm, I'm so excited. excited. I'm, I'm gonna get bedtime. four hours of sleep instead of just three. That was um, last night. Graphy, my my, my heart. Got in this game? My heart. My heart says Bose. Uh, my brain says Poise. Yeah. I'm in the same boat. Okay. Go Bows. I hope you I hope you do something fun and stupid. And you're the one team that figured out how to stop Ashton Jaunty. I actually hope you don't, because I want to see what he just continues to do to teams. I want to see him <laughs> if he can run for 3,000 yards, honestly. Um there's other games on the schedule though. There are a few. Let's uh, walk through them. There are a few. Um we refer to them uh, somewhat uh, uh oddly as the big boy games. Uh and the slate has several. Uh, that we're going to pay attention to starting on Saturday at 3:30 p.m. This is this is um as it recently has been a noon game but we're uh I imagine TV has said no no the Wed River Rivalry will be at 3:30 p.m. on the American Broadcasting Company. Number 1 Texas versus number 18 Oklahoma. This of course is on a neutral field in uh, Dallas in the old Cotton Bowl. The Horns are favored by 14, the AJ Fun Index is 49 and a half points. Um, AJ, what do you think? Uh, by the way, this game apparently got bumped from the noon slot on ABC by South Carolina, Alabama. Welcome to the SEC, Texas. You don't get to say shit. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, guys. Uh, <laughs> Beep. Um, <laughs> this game is this game is the true definition of a rivalry game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. This is what we think about. We we always joked about Bedlam, and the joke from the, the shutdown forecast was anything can happen in Bedlam except Oklahoma State winning. This is this is a proper rivalry game. True records out the window. Anything can happen. Games games where it looks like Texas is going to come in and steamroll Oklahoma. Oklahoma somehow figures out a way to win. And games where Oklahoma looks like they're the best team, Texas figures out a way to win. Yep. One of my favorite screenshots, uh, I believe, it was from the 2021 season. Um, no, it was the 22 season because it was mm-hmm. the first year of Quinn Ewers. Mm-hmm. And it's this guy in the stands, and he is just – it's him. Is it his Oklahoma shirt? He's giving horns down. He's so mad. And it was after a Texas touchdown. So everybody around him is and all Texas surrounded fans. And they're by all Texas going people. nuts. And he's just got the meanest face. Like, I don't <laughs> care. Horns down. This game is stupid every single time. Mm-hmm. And I refuse to put any sort of like, oh, Texas is coming into this game going, no. This game is about who's ready to be dumber. And I think Texas is ready to be dumber, right? This is, they have to win these games. This is the type of game that they have to win to maintain their cruising spot in the top 10 and maintain their spot in the playoff. We're starting to get into that period of time where it's like, hey, these regular season games where it's a rivalry game that you may drop, but it'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And they could probably still drop this game and be fine. I still think these are the games that really push you over the edge and get you ranked higher even if you're not in the championship game of your conference i'm taking the horns okay carla yeah this that's that's a good point there um because we, you know we we just joked about the, the how's the big 12 going to eat itself this week we're starting to see that happen in the upper echelon of the sec right particularly now with bama going down you know your your traditional powerhouses you know everybody has a loss except for texas mm-hmm. at this point and so if the horns are looking to punch their ticket to go to atlanta at the end of the season this is a game that they have to win it looks like the, that viewers is going to be back for this game um although that being said 
the horns have rolled with Arch. Like yep. it, it, it hasn't really seemed to to make that big of a difference. And the Sooners, meanwhile, I mean, you look at them. It's it's kind of shocking as to how they are ranked number eighteen in the country. They are dead last in the SEC in total offense, pass offense, and rush offense. Um, and and the Horns are near the the top of the conference in all defensive categories. Yep. So how do the Sooners score in this game? But like AJ said. It's a rivalry game, and every year in this rivalry, the team that looks like it's going to come in and just absolutely steamroll the other side is the team that loses. Um, and so the Horns better be ready here. They should win this game. They are the better team. But hang on to your hats. But I, I think I think the, the Horns figure out a way to win this, though. Okay. Hang okay. on to your very large golden hats. Big, yes. The big giant one. Ten yeah. gallons. That big. You guys uh, both referenced it, the, the, the recent history of this game. The, the team that should not win is the team that wins. Um, is that going to be the case this, this year? No, it is not. Um, the, the Sooners have a decent defense. Uh, would they, I, I would watch the uh, whole game against Tennessee, um, and they they did. It was more than a speed bump. They, they gave Tennessee some problems, uh, even, even in, a, in a loss at home. As Carla said, they're still figuring out offense. Um, they made a midseason quarterback change. Uh, it, it's not. It is not pretty. Um, the uh, Texas are simply Texas is is simply the most complete fe- team in college football right now. Um, they get healthy Quinn Ewers back. Uh, this is for for the trip to the old Cotton Bowl. Um, you always have the thing in the back of your mind. You know, goofy things happen in rivalry games and 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 all that stuff. I don't think uh, Texas is going to struggle a whole lot to win this game this year. I mean, the long horns um, at three thirty, Carla. Yes. On on uh, CBS. Number four, Penn State at the University of Southern California. The Nittany Lions are favored by five and a half points. The AJ Fun Index is a Big Tenny fifty and a half. Um, Carly, we'll let you begin. I, I, I could wax poetic here for a while, but I won't. I will keep my analysis because <laughs> we got a lot of football to get through here. Yeah. Um, so here are my concerns entering this game. First mm-hmm. of all, we talked about this on Saturday and we just mentioned this top of show. USC lost at Minnesota mm-hmm. last weekend, mm-hmm. which is like one of those upsets that has now totally flown under everybody's radars. Um, and the fact that somebody had a post about how everybody's forgetting the fact that Lincoln Riley just lost to PJ Fleck was yeah. one of the better posts of the oh, evening. That's good. That um, good one. So the Trojans here are looking for a get right game, mm-hmm. especially now that they are unranked because of that loss. Right. And those are always really dangerous situations. Um, the second thing that has me concerned about this game is that Penn state is becoming notorious this season for slow starts. Mm-hmm. They have True. not started well in any game this season. They did it against Illinois. They did it again last weekend against UCLA. Um, with an offense that is potentially as potent as SC's, Penn State cannot afford that slow of a start again. That being said, when USC went to the big house earlier this year, we made a statement that if USC could have played one iota of defense, mm-hmm. they would have won that game. Make Make one tackle. In the fourth right? quarter, one tackle that's all they needed to make, and they would have mm-hmm. won that football game. They gave up 360 yards to Minnesota last weekend, yeah. a team not necessarily known for its offensive prowess. Right? We could, we, we said then, you know, that SC could have beaten Michigan. I think that statement holds mm-hmm. true again this weekend, and it ends up being the difference here is that SC's defense just isn't quite up to the task of completely shutting down the Penn State offense. This game is tight because every time. Penn State plays on the West Coast, C, Rose Bowl. Um, it ends up being really interesting, right? Mm-hmm. So this game is really tight. Penn State figures out a way to win this game on the road. But it's the third week in a row that I'm not going to be comfortable, and I'm getting really <laughs> tired of this. Nitz, can you get your acts together, please? Stop it. Stop it. AJ, what do you think? I think it's funny that USC, a team that would get – all the way through a season and then just get eat up like a complete sock full of quarters from Utah went to a conference that's oops all utah um like <laughs> right. you went to the you went to the like most bag of hammers conference possible mm-hmm. i hope that listen I, that check clears but 
this is the thing that USC is running into. They cannot finesse their way. And I'm wearing a literal Pac-12 team issued quarter zip right now. Mm -hmm. It's so comfy. It's very nice. It, it really is. But it's lovely. You cannot tell me in any way, shape, or form that you as a finesse team are going to try and get through a team like Penn State who is looking rather complete defensively and offensively. And as Carlo mentioned, they just need to get it going a little quicker. But other than that, they're doing well. I cannot in any way, shape, or form, unless they figure out something in the Penn State defense that they can absolutely pick apart offensively and try and turn this into a shootout and make Drew Aller and that offense try to go point for point with Lincoln Riley and that offense, I do not see a way for USC to win this game. They're going to get hit in the face with a bag of nickels. Give me the Penn State Indian Lions to win. Carlo, the one thing that I would I would quibble with you about uh, if we're talking uh, about the, 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 the SC game at Michigan, um, as we've discussed, Michigan has no offense. Um, yeah, also true. And and while while SC was good enough to 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 come back after a slow start of their own in that game, um, they they still couldn't overcome the uh, the the juggernaut Wolverines um, and uh, running football and, and all of that stuff. Penn State, however has a, has a, a a fantastic offense um one that that starts slow uh admittedly but um they throw the ball downfield which they have not done recently uh they continue to have the um the 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 two-headed monster at tailback and it and it looks like uh Nick Singleton after a a week on the bench for some kind of injury is going to play again this year with a, a play again this week with Katron Allen um and I, and I, and as a bonus, I think Penn State's defense is better than Michigan's. So, um, SC is is learning what it is to be a Big Ten team, um, and this week is going to be another lesson. Uh, Penn State is going to win this game on the West Coast, uh, and I think you're going to be comfortable by the fourth quarter. I hope. Okay, okay. I hope. that's fair. That's fair. Guys, we have to talk about the Pitt Panthers. Ranked Pitt Panthers. The ranked Pitt Panthers at 3.30 p.m. on ESPN. Cal visits number 22, Pittsburgh. The Panthers are favored by three. The AJ Fun Index is uh, 59 and a half points. AJ, what do you think about your ranked Pitt Panthers? They are act, uh, you know, that whole thing where Pat Narduzzi just didn't want to play offense last year, yeah, and he was just going to try defense his way because he went like full, you, you can't make me score points after Kenny Pickett left. Uh, they they, they goofed around and they figured out that scoring points is actually a way to win football games. It, it turns is. out putting more points on the board than the other team helps. That's how you um, do. they won in uh, in Chapel Hill for the first time ever mm -hmm. last week. Mm -hmm. Um, they look great. Cal let off their get let off the gas. Uh, crappy, what time did you go to bed? Um, on, on when Saturday about night. when that game was starting. Okay, Carla, what, how, what did you make it to? I made it to twenty eight to ten, so I missed the one that put them up thirty five to ten. Um, so okay. I went to bed at twenty eight to ten. So that was in the third quarter at some point. I went to bed at thirty nine thirty eight. <laughs> I watched that collapse. And it hurt. It Oof. hurt the whole time because we're all jazzed up about a full, proper, honest to goodness, the first blood week since 2022, where we have Alabama and all these other teams losing. Mm -hmm. And Cal's got another one on the ropes. Like we were about yep. to get one more yep. before we before we close the door for the night. And we thought it was in the bag because it was 35 to 10 at one point. Yeah. And here comes Miami. And they dragged it all the way back. And it was basically just Cal got gassed. Mm -hmm. They they couldn't keep it up for the rest of the game. They couldn't keep their foot on the gas. They couldn't stop Miami. Um, it was a targeting call that should have been called. That should have probably ended the game. And it didn't get called. Thanks, ACC refs. And because that, again, was a conference game. 
Um, I think the biggest thing here is Cal coming off of a letdown against Florida State and Miami. Remember, they were three and zero going into the Florida State game. They lost. Mm-hmm. They lost to FSU. Then they welcomed Miami. Now they got to come back across the country <laughs> and Oof. play a pit team that is five and zero and feeling like they've got something rolling here. Mm-hmm. I don't know if the Calgarhythm has enough momentum. I really don't. Um, I would like to see them get it together. They really need Jaden Ott to get off the, to get off the ground. They the, Miami actually did a really good job of keeping Jaden Ott away from the end zone. He he did score a very long touchdown, but it was on a pass. Mm-hmm. They actually held uh, Cal's rushing offense to a very very low number. I think Pitt can do the same thing. Um, this has got a proper fun point total on it too. Uh, so keep an eye on this game. This is on ESPN at three thirty. Give me Pitt to win though. Carla. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. My, my statement here was, goodness, Cal, I mean, what a schedule, right? You go cross country to nearly beat Florida State, then lose by a point at home at Miami, only to go back across the country to play a pit team that likes, get this, close games. Stop me if you've heard me that, uh, you know, heard that before. <laughs> um, I'm exhausted just thinking about it. Um, so, yeah, Pitt's unbeaten. All their wins are really tight, really. Yeah. Um, but they have one of the best offenses in the ACC. Now, there's a statement for you. Um <laughs> Eli Holstein has more than 1,500 yards passing in five games. Mm -hmm. Cal plays pretty good defense. They're third in the ACC in scoring defense. And as much as I want to get on the the Calgorithm bandwagon, right? Like, I I, I want to get on that. I have to wonder if fatigue plays a factor here. I mean, this is a team, another long road trip against a really good offense. Stop me if you've heard that before. I, I, I just think... If there's a bye week between last week and this week, I would give Cal a shot here on the road. But I just they're gassed. That's a good point. They're absolutely they're absolutely gassed. Um, Pitt's gonna hit the win at home. Um, I, the idea that that we're we're talking about Pitt at this point of the season is is a little uh, puzzling to me. But uh, give them credit. Uh, the, the especially the Panthers' offense. Uh, has been fantastic. They have they have played very well. Uh, the cow man Eli Holstein, um, he is he is having a year, uh, and and it doesn't always show up in in his numbers. Uh, like it, his uh, QB rating is a fifty sixth in the country, um, but he just he has a knack for getting it done, and he's he's done it in uh, comebacks uh, on the road at Cincinnati. He's done it uh, in the rivalry game against West Virginia. Um, Cal, uh, Carl, as you said, Cal's Cal has got to be reeling um, to to lose that game the way they did, and then have to pack up and come back to the East Coast. Uh, it, it's got to be physically taxing. It's got to be uh, mentally and emotionally difficult uh, to to come back on the field after that loss. Um, and 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 I'd like your your point about if there was a bye week. Um, I, I might think about this game differently uh, because Cal is solid, but I think um, as it is uh, coming into Pittsburgh um, in a, in a hot offense like that, I think, uh, I think the Panthers are the pick there at seven 30 on NBC. Number two, Ohio state uh, plays number three, Oregon uh, in Autzen. My Buckeyes are favored by three. The AJ Fund Index is 53 and a half. (sighs) Uh, Carla, how do you see this game? So I look at this game and I'm still wondering if Oregon is really one of the best three teams in the country. Okay. Um, Yes, they're unbeaten. They got off to a really slow start to the season, Mm -hmm. right? And their three most recent wins are over Oregon State, UCLA, and Sparty. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. Dylan Gabriel, sure. Statistically, he's having a better season thus far than Will Howard, if you want to compare numbers there, right? But I just keep looking at those Buckeye defensive numbers. Mm -hmm. They're tops in the conference with one exception, Mm -hmm. pass defense. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's not necessarily a good thing playing against a good passing offense. But to balance that out, the Oregon defense is not great against the run. So the key for a Buckeye win here, and I foresee a Buckeye win here is that Buckeye ground game. Mm -hmm. Your offensive line, you know, Trey, the slew of backs that you have as well. Mm -hmm. That's the key here. I think 
Oregon is going to learn a similar lesson to what you talked about with USC mm-hmm. about entering the, you know, the, the ground and pound kind of yep. conference here. Yep. Um, you are, Ohio state is going to eventually wear them down. It's mm-hmm. going to take a while, but I think in the second half, Ohio state asserts its dominance here and gets a really big win on the road. Okay. AJ, what do you think? Neither one of these teams has played anybody of note. Nope. I just want to be real clear about that. Both Absolutely. of them have played Sparty. Mm-hmm. Um, crap, I just had it up. Uh, Oregon won 31 to 10. Ohio State won 38 7. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> in my mind, it's hard to gauge the differences here. I think the biggest thing, as Carla kind of mentioned, is at this point, when you look at the overall defenses of these teams, Ohio State has an absurd numbers on defense. They've mm-hmm. given up 34 points total this season. Um, they are number one in points per game. Uh, Oregon has given up 85 points. Uh, so that's 17 points per game versus 6.8 for Ohio State. Mm-hmm. Uh, in terms of yards per game, Ohio State's given up 60 fewer yards per game. It, Ohio State against a – let's – call it what it is, ain't played nobody, mm-hmm. schedule, They their defense is showing like a top-level defense would play against not great competition. Yep. Oregon's defense has looked a little bit more suspect. The biggest thing, and I cannot stop thinking about it, is Ashton Jaunty just running through that defense. Yep. Yes. They, that game opened my eyes real quick to the cape of to basically where that defense stands. Mm-hmm. Um Jaunty gave up where hold on, I just want to make sure I get his numbers right here. He had 25 carries for 192 yards and three touchdowns. Mm-hmm. Right through the middle of that defense. Hey Ohio State, you have two of the best backs in the country. Use them. This is a mash them into the ground game yep. if you want to go win. Yes, you can absolutely use your NFL wide receiver room and your very good experienced quarterback too. And they will. But you should turn them into paste Yeah, if that's what Ash- Ashton Jaunty and Boise State can do to them. Yep. You should be turning them into pace. This is again just like the Penn State USC game. You should be coming in with the bag of nickels and showing them what Big Ten football is. Give me Ohio State to win, and I think uh, this this opens some eyes to where where Oregon fits into the overall landscape. Okay. Okay. Um, Rappy, talk to us. Let us know how you feel. <laughs> This was the game, by the way, if you go back, for those of you who might be listening and your new listeners at the start of the season, Mm -hmm. Rappy had this game circled as like, this is the season other than Michigan. This is it right here. Yes. And circled on the calendar. I actually put in my- Penn State too. Penn State too. But this is is the first test. Absolutely. Yeah. This is, I actually had this day as a Mm -hmm. whole blocked Mm -hmm. off on my calendar of like, no, I'm not doing anything. I'm watching football all day. This is one of the few days on the calendar that I've done that. I think- this is this is the first like true test of the schedule, and it's nice to see the Big Ten having a little bit more of these yeah. tests earlier mm-hmm. in the season, mm-hmm. other than what they had the last few years, where it's like Ohio State, and Michigan, and Penn State don't play anybody until they get to November, and then they all play each other. Yep. Um, so you have no idea who anybody truly is. Crappy, how you feel? Um, good, good. Uh, Ohio State's been a little slow to start with, um, in in terms of uh, pass defense. Uh, they've given up some yardage, haven't given up a lot of points. Um, but that's that is a concern when you're talking about a passing offense like like the Ducks have. Um, I will point out that that Ohio State's defense is doing things this year that it did not do a year ago. Uh, and and a year ago it, it was a, it had a very good scoring defense, um, but uh, picks, turnovers, uh, seventeen sacks so far this season. Um, that that is a crazy number, uh, and and I know Oregon has a uh, is is a, an exceptional pass protection team, um, but getting a little pressure on Dylan Gabriel is going to make a big deal. Oregon's also struggled against teams that run the football. Uh, AJ, as you said, and this the the uh, Ohio State's averaging seven yards a carry. 
um they have a they have a back uh who can be physical uh and still outrun you um they have a back who is difficult to tackle um because he's shifty and they have an offensive line that for the first time in in a couple of years has looked to be dominant that's going to be tested this weekend uh because as as you said Ohio State hasn't played anybody. Uh, 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 Iowa at home last week is the best, uh, the best uh, team, best competition that Ohio State's seen. Uh, running the put- football, as we know, opens up other things uh, as they move safeties closer and closer to the line of scrimmage, um, forces teams to maybe play um, uh, play one on one, play man coverage where maybe you wouldn't really want to. Nobody. Nobody has had an answer for Jeremiah Smith. Um, I'm betting the Ducks don't either. Uh, so we're going to run the football first. Um, it's going to be a physical game. And when we have the opportunity, then uh, Chip Kelly's offense makes you makes you defend the entire width of the field. Um, we'll, we'll see some passes. We'll see some screens. We'll see some slants. Uh, and and uh, that's where Ohio State's going to um, uh, is going to score. Ohio State's going to win this one, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll set up what happens for the rest of the season. Can I add one ah, stat here that's kind of please, interesting that I just do. noticed? Mm-hmm. Oregon has given up 507 yards of rushing mm-hmm. this season mm-hmm. in five games. Mm-hmm. Let's submit about 101 yards per Good game, much. right? Mm-hmm. If you take out the Boise State game, which is 221 of those yards, mm-hmm. it's half the season is in that one game. It drops down to about 74 yards per game. Mm -hmm. So there's potentially some interesting numbers in there um, where that puts them down into the Ohio State, Penn State territory. Ohio State's given up 72.6 yards per game. Penn State is at 76.2 yards per game. I might have said Penn State twice there. But in that range of rush defenses, that could uh, – I would be interested to see if Oregon has learned from what Boise did to them, mm-hmm. and if Ohio State is capable of taking advantage is capable of taking advantage of those things where other teams just didn't have the skill to be able to do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So there's your game. I think I think that's gonna I think that that'll be a thing. Um, there is more. Uh, as, as much as I would I would I would be happy to stop right there, but uh, there's more. There's more games this weekend that we got to talk about. Also at 7.30 uh, on ABC, number nine, Ole Miss at number 13, Louisiana State. Uh, Ole Miss is favored um, by three and a half points. The AJ Fund Index is a legitimately fun 63 and a half. Um, AJ, is this going to be a fun game? This game, is the, this game is up there with Red River in terms of this is just a dumb game. Okay. Just it's a dumb game. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, here's the thing, though. Ole Miss doesn't beat LSU in these games. It's a bedlam type game mm-hmm. where it's always stupid, but LSU somehow finds a way to win. Um, LSU has been super interesting this year offensively yeah. because they've actually been able to somewhat keep up with what they were doing last year, but without Jaden Daniels. Mm-hmm. Um, not fully, but they've been able to keep up there. Ole Miss, though, is an absolute offensive machine. I expect absolutely nothing less from them. Um, it is, it's been very, very interesting. They're averaging 44 points per game and they're averaging, where's their total offensive yards. They've got, they're averaging 576 yards of offense per game. Like they're going to put up a ton of points and that's with Kentucky dragging them down in the mud and yes. losing. Yep. So they put up a ton of offense. I think this is going to be a, a points fireworks factory. So if, Ohio State and Oregon gets into a rock fight mm-hmm. on the other channel. You can put that on and watch things go boom. Um, I won't be doing it, but yeah, I don't disagree. Give me, give me LSU to win. <laughs> it's a Saturday night in Death Valley. Yes, this is a night game in Death Valley. There is an aura and a mystique to it. Give me LSU to win in a very stupid game. Sweet, Carla. Yeah, remember when we were all talking about Ole Miss losing to Kentucky a couple of weeks ago, right? Mm-hmm. Like, they're back in the top ten. Yeah. Um, but they're heading to Baton Rouge to play a Tiger team that's had a week off after two get-right games against UCLA and South Alabama. Mm-hmm. Offensively, though, as we've already alluded to, you, LSU is good, but they're pretty one-dimensional. They're kind of Garrett Nussmeyer or bust. 
Um, they're near the bottom of the SEC in rush yardage. And so when you look at it, here's why I think Ole Miss is favored in okay. this game. Because LSU's pass defense is dead last in the SEC. Mm-hmm. Dead last. Going up against the top pass offense in the conference. That's going to be a tough hill to climb, even in Death Valley on a Saturday night. I, As much as I, it pains me to say this. It okay. pains me to say this. Give me the fighting Kiffins on the road. Mm. Um, Death Valley is, is is absolutely a tough place to play at night uh, on Saturday night. There, it it is it is brutal. Um, I, but that's that has uh, historically been when LSU has uh, a, a defense to go along with uh, a a high firepower offense. Um, they don't have that that kind of defense this season. Um. The fun index indicates there is a belief that the uh, the Rebels defense, which is ranked third in scoring defense so far this season, um, might not be enough to slow down LSU to the point where you would look at this and think, okay, uh, Ole Miss has got this one in the back. I uh, this is this is tough. Uh, it is going to be a silly game. Uh, there are going to be a ton of points. I think. The atmosphere is going to be just enough to give LSU the kick in the ass it needs to win this game at home. So that's 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 where I'm going. Um, we'll we'll see what the uh, what the uh, what the the, the point total is going to be, um, but it should be a fun one. Uh, AJ, LSU and LSU yeah. and Virginia have the same defensive stats. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Okay. Um not a good company, just so we're clear. <laughs> <laughs> um uh, you referenced this one, AJ, and we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about it because it's I it, it is absolutely the trap game of the weekend. Uh 8 yeah. p.m. on Fox number eleven, Iowa State at WVU. Um the Cyclones are favored by three. The AJ Fun Index is 52 and a half. Um Carla, does the does the 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 Big Twelve eat a chung here? So yeah, are the Cyclones legit? Eh. Sure. <laughs> um, like okay, so it's easy to look past this game with West Virginia's two losses, right? Mm. This is a night game in Morgantown. We all know the mystique about this. Crazy things happen in Morgantown after dark. And that's why I think the line on this game is so tight. That and because of one factor. Mm-hmm. Iowa State isn't statistically great against the run. They're good in all other defensive areas, but mm-hmm. the ground game has given them fits. And guess what West Virginia likes to do? Huh. Run the dang football. So if the ears can control the line of scrimmage and the time of possession in this game, mm-hmm. look out. West Virginia can win this game on at home um, on a Saturday night in Margaretown. What the heck? What the heck? Let's let the Big 12 eat its young. West Virginia wins. Why not? <laughs> AJ, what do you think? I'm I'm with it. I, I think West Virginia gets this win. Mm-hmm. We lose another conference current title leader. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think right now uh, Iowa State is currently tied for uh, – sorry, they're tied for second in the conference – Quick guess as to who's in the lead in the Big 12 right now. Ooh, ooh, I know this. Uh, uh, go ahead, Carla. Go ahead. Texas Tech. It's Texas Tech, the team that almost lost at home to Abilene Christian to start the season is currently leading your Big 12. <laughs> what a stupid conference. Again, this world. is the best conference. Um, Everything is BYU weird. is right behind Texas Tech. And again, BYU had some sketchy games earlier this year, too. Mm-hmm. Iowa State, I think you're right, Carla. It is, they, they, they kind of look, they look good. Here's the thing. The only their closest game was El Asico against Iowa. Mm-hmm. Everything other than that, they have won handily. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's really what's carrying them up the rankings in terms of them being 11th. I think WVU, this is one of those trap games. WVU gets them on a night in Morgantown. WVU's not bad. Their their two mm-hmm. losses are to Pitt and to who's the other one? Uh, Penn State, so they've lost the the Pennsylvania triumvirate, mm-hmm. but they're not in the Big Twelve, and so it can't hurt them there. Nope. I 
I think WVU comes out, gets a win, and as a a shot at kind of taking over some of the Big Twelve uh, and moving up the rankings there. So give me WVU. Um, West Virginia runs football over and over and over. Uh, the crowd in Morgantown on a Saturday night goes absolutely nuts. Um, we find out that maybe Iowa State isn't the number 11th ranked team in the country. And the Mountaineers uh, are going to ride that atmosphere to a uh, to an upset win at home on Saturday. Hide your couches. Hide your couches. Uh, at 10.15 p.m., um, on ESPN, number 18, K-State at Colorado. Hmm. Uh, the Cats are favored by four. The AJ Fund Index is uh, 56 and a half points. AJ, what do you think? Colorado is fraud. Like, every time I see Colorado play, mm-hmm. every single time, like, yes, they're 2-0, and they're 4-1, and like, there's something about it. They they barely beat Baylor. Mm-hmm. They did get the win over UCF at in Orlando. There's just something about them. They just do not seem to have the like. They lack the grit, mm-hmm. and they're about to play grit the football team. Like yes. <laughs> th- I think that's the big thing here. They're about to go play a Kansas State team that is all about just we're gonna run it down your throat. Mm-hmm. Colorado still does not have an answer for that. They are real, real bad against the run. Mm-hmm. It's, it really comes down to, can Travis Hunter continue his Heisman candidacy of playing two different positions for an entire season and not get tired? This was the point of the season where he fell apart. Mm-hmm. This is when he got hurt last year. This is when he got cooked against Stanford. This is where the like wear and tear of the season started to hit. Mm-hmm. And he's playing a team like like Kansas State that wants to run that wants to basically hurt you mm-hmm. running the football. I think this is the game that kind of points out Colorado is still as soft as we think they are. This looks like the Nebraska game. Give me K State to win. Carla, your Power Cats. Yeah. Um, did they have a test? It, it it is to an extent, right? Like mm-hmm. it, I mean, they, they've been all over the place mm-hmm. this year. Um, you know, had some a couple of inex inexplicable kind of like what what the what the heck just happened Mm -hmm. um after dark in boulder that's that can be it that can be a tough atmosphere now it didn't Mm -hmm. used to be but now it is right because they've turned that around up and up in colorado um but the buffs are one-dimensional like aj said i mean there should be travis hunter in the air attack period Mm -hmm. end of statement that's it that's what they've got um my concern about this game is that the power cats have not been great in the secondary this season. Mm-hmm. Um, and so my concern is whether or not they can slow down that offensive attack, but like AJ mentioned, Colorado can't stop the run and K state has one of the best ground games in the big 12. Mm-hmm. Um, so can that ground game do enough damage to keep up with that prolific buffs offense? I, <sighs> It's gonna it's gonna come down to a thread, I think. I'm mm-hmm. gonna take my cats here because that's what I do. Um, but I'm a little, you know, as long as they can sl- throw a speed bump, mm-hmm. they should be able to leverage that ground and pound kind of game to be able to get a win on the road here. But that atmosphere is tough, and that offense on on the opposing sideline is good, but one dimensional. Give me the power cats. E. Okay. okay. I w- I do wonder about Kansas State's ability to get to Shador. That's okay. how North Dakota State kept it close. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, they were giving up pass plays. If Shador got the ball out and he could get the ball to Travis Hunter or he could get the ball to Joe Horn, it, it was a problem for yeah. that secondary. And I, I expect the same thing to happen to Kansas State. I think Kansas State's defensive line can get to Shador first. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the bigger thing here because okay. Colorado's not going to run the football. They, they're just no. not. Okay. Um, they're on the line to do it. And I think that's where this game changes. Crappy, who you got here? Um, I, it has been a theme of the of today's show that uh, when you're looking at the matchup of a physical team against a finesse team, and and Colorado's a finesse team. Let's let let's, let's not uh, uh, let let's not make a mistake about that. Um, that generally the physical team is the one that you 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 want to uh, you you want to back. 
Um, your AJ, your comparison to the Nebraska game is especially apt. Um, I, I, I see the same thing happening here. Um, there's going to be pressure on Sanders. Um, I, I think you make an excellent point about uh, a Travis Hunter getting worn down. Um, whether or not that that happens this weekend or next weekend, or um, but in in a physical game that could that could show up. Uh, it could show up before uh, before you might expect it to. I'm sh- I'm sure Boulder. Um, it, you know that the, there are a bunch of bandwagon folks, and they're going to make that uh, a, a fun atmosphere. But uh, the Powercats are going to win this one at home uh, or on the road. Excuse me, and uh, and uh, maybe expose Colorado for for what it is once again. Boys and girls, you can hear the Carlin Crappy Show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and a variety of other podcasting hosts. You can watch us on YouTube or on the show's Facebook page, or, you know, both. Um, You may recall from a year ago or from last week when I said the same thing, you can read us on our Substack. If you like us, please subscribe, rate, and review. If you don't, mind your own damn business. Uh, And be sure to come back next week when we see exactly how wrong we were. Um, AJ, uh, anything else that you are looking forward to this weekend? This is the tro- This is a, a, a on paper great weekend of football, mm-hmm. but it is still a weekend of football. Yeah. Dumb things can happen. We talked. We uh, I skipped over a bunch of G five stuff in the middle of the day. There's a lot of scoreboard surfing to do. Mm-hmm. Keep it on the scoreboard. When things get funky, go open the t- go open your YouTube TV or go find that game on ESPN Plus. Very nice. They're always good. <laughs> Carla, what are you? Uh, what are you games are you looking forward to this weekend that we perhaps did not talk about? So just a couple of quick notes here because you know Big Ten girl in me. Um, why not Wisconsin at Rutgers? AJ, okay, a game just for you. No, um, noon Eastern <laughs> Big Ten Network is Rutgers for real. Mm. Uh, a win over Bucky would do a lot for perception, mm-hmm. um, especially after dropping that agonizing 14 to seven big 10 of all big 10 E games last week at Nebraska. Um, so I think we'll find out what, what records is made of this week, a game that is remarkable that we didn't talk about it again this year. It always happens the same week as red river. Hello, Florida at number eight, Tennessee. Um, yeah, there's it. So, you know, that's at seven Eastern on ESPN. The Vols are reeling after that loss right now. Florida's looked solid the last couple of weeks. I it, Tennessee is ob- absolutely 100% still the pick here, but I feel a little bit differently about this game than I did a few weeks ago. A little okay. Bit. Um, okay. If you understand Florida football, there are two games that they care about, Florida State and Tennessee. Um, hmm. And if they win the Tennessee game, mm-hmm. that in and of itself could save Billy Napier's job. So... Florida's going to come in hyped for this game. Okay, We'll see how Nico and that young offense responds to mm-hmm. this kind of situation, but they're playing at home. Tennessee's still absolutely the pick here, but Florida could make this more interesting than we thought even just a couple weeks ago. Um, on a personal note, AJ, Robert Morris homecoming. Um, Bobby Moe homecoming this week versus Delaware State, 3 Eastern. I cannot find TV for that, so check the um, – you might have to listen to the to the audio call of our dear friend Chris Shevelin, um, which also would not be a terrible way to consume that game. Hi, Chris. Um, so that game's at 3. Robert Morris – I don't think there's a line on that game, but um, Robert Morris should be favored in that game, and I would expect them to win. Um, and my final note here, friends, <clears throat> let's talk to our kids about a 6 and 0 bowl eligible Indiana because that happened last week. It's Indiana so weird. bowl eligible 6 games, 6 wins. You're going bowling, Hoosiers. Enjoy. <laughs> there is there is a distinct potential that we mm-hmm. have mm-hmm. for 9 win Indiana to actually happen. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Like 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 for real, this might happen. <laughs> uh, and and listen, I know that the transfer portal and coaches moving around has has changed a lot of things. Yes. Right now, Indiana, according to FPI, has a 1.4% chance of winning the national title. This has been the Carla and Crappy Show, and I hope that you have a <laughs> wonderful time watching all of the games this weekend. Things have gone very weird. The portal <laughs> has changed everything, and we it's, hope you have a great time. It's a very odd thing. I, I I have one, well, a couple things to add. 
Um, <laughs> and we will just, just because I, I will be spending some time this weekend uh, with two, not one, but two CMUs. Uh, the first one is the Essential Michigan Chippewas. They are hosting my Ohio Bobcats. Um, uh, OU is favored by three. The uh, the uh, AJ Fun Index is a not so fun forty eight and a half points. Um, so we're we're looking for uh, Bobcats to uh, to go two and zero in the MAC, um, which is suddenly uh, the MAC East is wide open um, with uh, Miami uh, sucking. Um, because they were picked to, to win the division at some point. So we'll see how that goes. The other CMU uh, I want to talk about is Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, they won last weekend, uh, beat Waynesburg 42 to nothing. And that gets the Tartans to what is unquestionably the game of the year. Uh, Carnegie Mellon is ranked number 10. They are at number six. Grove City on Saturday. Um, the, I, if I needed a reason to to hate Grove City more, um, I was not aware until this very weekend, uh, this very week, that they are nicknamed the Wolverines. Um, they are four and zero. They are pretty much a mirror image of of uh, Carnegie Mellon on both sides of the field. If you're in Pittsburgh, you can actually watch this game on KDKA Plus. Uh, if you're not, it will be streamed on YouTube. Um, I'm going to check in on it. Absolutely. Uh, because this is a this is going to be one of the big games in D three, uh, this weekend. Go, Tartans. AJ, I'm glad you got back and uh, and were, was able to join us this week. This is fantastic. Thank you for being. We did here. some zooming, but we we made it. Now I'm on Zoom. Now I'm zooming, time. and then and then on Zoom, Carla. Um, thank you as always, and especially thank you for getting uh, once again for getting Andrew to uh, to join us this week. Um, that uh, that's that was a, a great interview, great time to talk to him. Absolutely. Going to be another great week of football. Going to be another great week of football. Uh, boys and girls, um, thank you for uh, for watching, for listening, for reading, for all of the things. Uh, we hope you have a great weekend of college football. We hope your team does well, unless you live in Ann Arbor. And uh, we will talk to you next week. Cheers, everyone. <laughs>